John Benjamin Hickey stars in the fourth season of HBO's In Treatment as Colin, um, a former tech titan who is uh, grappling with the most tumultuous period in his personal and professional life. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Uh, John, it's a pleasure to have you. I wanna start um, by asking you about Colin because he's such a complex and enigmatic character. I'm wondering if there was one character trait or moment in, in Colin's life in which you really grabbed onto when you started to develop um, this really interesting and, and hard to decipher um, individual. Yeah, I want to congratulate you for describing him in what sounded like maybe two sentences, because <laughs> I find it impossible to describe this guy in, in, in less than four paragraphs. He was such a mass of contradictions. And I think to answer your question, that's the thing I loved most about him, is just when you had him pegged uh, as uh, a, a lot of different bad and some good things, he kind of upends that and, um, and subverts your expectations. And certainly uh, Dr. Taylor, Uzo Aduba's character, her expectations. So they continually surprise each other. You know, um, I think the, this character was for the writers a chance to write a straight white male, part of the patriarchy, patri patriarchy, if you will, hard for me to say that word, um, uh, you know, and they really went to great lengths not to reduce him to somebody who could just be taken down to a stereotype, to a target, um, which would be easy, let's face it, would be very easy in this world we're living in uh, to do that but they created a, a very um, uniquely fucked up guy who's, uh, who's got things going on inside of him that surprise even him because he thought he was so, sort of on the right side of a lot of issues. And uh, it turns out by virtue of this relationship, he learns that he's not necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, despite Colin's flaws, some of which you've just enumerated, um, and I think, you know, it would be fair to say that one of his greatest challenges is uh, his relationship to the truth and to honesty. Uh, um, you know, despite those challenges, we do actually see some moments in these sessions with Dr. Taylor of genuine growth um, and self-reflection. So what was it like for you over the course of the season to try to chart that, uh, that emotional trajectory where you know, obviously the character is is grappling and there are moments and maybe we can talk about this where, you know, he maybe relapses a little bit into some of his past behavior, but what was it like to really find those actual genuine moments for, for Colin? Um, surprising and surprising in a lot of ways. Um, one of the great things about doing a, a, a television uh, in a serial form, you know, is that you sometimes, you're, learning who you are along with the audience. So Colin would say certain things at his second session to Dr. Taylor, and I myself believed them to be true. And I'm so glad that I did because I played them as true. Not everything. I knew I had some overall idea of what his narrative was, but um, there were certain things that he is being deceptive about that you learn later um, was just that. And I, I loved being able to find the sincerity in all of that deception, because I do think underneath all of his pain, all of his uh, narcissism, I think is say, he's safe to call him that, and, and, uh, and a pathological uh, um, avoidance of the truth in certain uh, instances, I found him to be a genuine person whose pain was, was real and was uh, deeply felt by the writers and not made fun of, as I said before, not reduced. So the more I learned about him, even the bad stuff, the more human he became to me. Because when you play uh, a messed up person or a bad guy, which I think some people might call Colin a bad guy, um, you can't you have to find the, you have to have empathy for them. You have to find out what there is to love about them. And I think his, um, 
his weirdly he's innocent about um there's an innocence about him for all of his uh, cr cr you know criminal behavior for all of his lying for all of his uh, manipulation he thinks he's manipulating dr taylor there there's a part of him that's deeply innocent about the world and his place in it yeah did you i'm so glad you mentioned the process of in that process of discovering that there are some moments you didn't realize when you were reading the script whether it was factual or not right you kind of believed um yeah. certain aspects until you read more so were you getting scripts on a weekly basis how much did you or did you have like a bible of this is Colin's true story. How much did you know when you were going into it versus what you found out, you know, weeks or months into shooting? Uh, they they were great. Uh, Jen Schur, Josh Allen, and Zach Whedon, who actually penned my scripts. I didn't get to meet Zach. He was writing from Toronto. Mm. They had all six of my scripts written. I'm in six of the episodes. Um, mm. They had them written and they told me sort of the major plot points but the the four of us agreed in a meeting, like, do you want to read them all? We think it would be better if you were surprised. Mm. Uh, and I agreed with them just purely as an actor who wants so much to just sort of live in the moment and believe what's going on in the moment and not play something that's 10 miles down the road. Um, so I liked that, but I also, uh, you know, you got a script and page scene one begins on page one and is over on page 28 and you're doing most of the talking. So there was a part of me that said, you know what, guys, I don't want to see all six of those scripts because it's only going to remind me that I have to basically learn, you know, uh, a Dostoevsky novel <laughs> in, in, in 10 days. It's the, it's the biggest challenge, acting challenge I've ever had as far as memorization goes. Wow. So. It was it, so it was practical too. I could I could not freak out completely if I had one script in front of me and eight days to learn it. If I started looking down the road at the next thirty pages, I might have had a serious breakdown, bigger than Collins. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering. You know, so many people know you from your television roles, right? Your Emmy nominated work on The Big C. Manhattan, uh, two of my favorite series of all time, The Good Wife and The Good Fight. Um, but so many others also know you from your uh, Tony winning stage work in The Normal Heart uh, and in the past uh, Broadway season, your Tony nominated role for The Inheritance. How much or did, did your experience in theater and your kind of grounding in that process, how did that help you work through, you know, these Dostoevsky-esque um, yeah. scripts for in treatment because they're really you know you and uzo are are essentially doing small two character plays uh Absolutely. once a week yeah yeah you know it's such a great question because i have done a whole lot of theater i've been around a long time i've done a lot of tv and film too but i i think my home is in the theater and uh and I've done, you know, I've done my share of four, like four camera sitcoms, which a lot of people say, oh, it's the closest to doing a play because there's an audience and you're, it's nothing like doing a play. I mean, they're great. They're amazing for what they are, but it doesn't feel anything like this is the first thing I've done in, in uh, that's being filmed that felt like a play. Because as I said, you know, scene one in a television script usually begins on page one and is over just like half a page later. You know, that's all, that's the whole first scene. This goes on for 28 pages and it's just two people talking so it really felt like a two character play and in the beginning <laughs> it was really great with uh me and uzo we had so much fun because the director would say okay we're going to start rolling on page one and you know we'll say cut like four or five pages down we'll just let you guys kind of get your wheels turning and a couple of times uzo and i started going and we kept going and going and going and both of us had, and this is, it was Herculean for me. It was a miracle that Uzo, mm -hmm. because she was doing this like backwards and in high heels, you know, like Ginger Rogers. She was having to learn it for four different people, three different other people. Right. Um, so, so we keep going. And then 28 pages later, the director would say cut and she, the, she and the crew 
they would all be like, we've never seen anything like that. I'm not saying like we screwed up quite a bit in those 28 pages and maybe once we had to call for line, but every now and then it felt like Uzo and I were on our own planet on stage and, and we were doing this just for ourselves. And it, that's a very liberating feeling and really, really exciting. Because there are no moving parts in this. It's just the actors, which is one of the things that's so great about the show. Yeah, I can imagine. And you've anticipated a lot of my questions because I really wanted to ask and know what the process of shooting was like. And you've, you've just given us some insight to that. So I'll ask it a bit differently. What was it like to rehearse? How much did, did you and Uzo work through the script? How much did you want to hold it back and save? I mean, so much of it is so raw. How much did you want to kind of retain for when the cameras were rolling? Well, um, insanely enough, Uzo and, I, Uzo and I did not get a chance to rehearse together much at all, which I actually think worked out so great because it's not like we had a lot of moving pieces, right? You know, it's not like we had to pull out a gun or get in a car and drive somewhere. We, we just had the sofa and the chair and us talking. So we really had only ourselves to depend on. Um, but it, I would, I would, my, my rehearsal would be taking, I just had just adopted two little puppies mm -hmm. and, um, and they were about four months old and I would put them on a leash and I would take my, my script. I'm, I'm old enough to where I can't learn lines off of an iPad. I have to have a tactile thing in my hand. And I would walk them through uh, Laurel Canyon with the script in my hand, saying these words out loud. To I finally had to, I never wore earpods. I finally had to get them earpods because people would look at me in Runyon Canyon or wherever and be like, that guy seems like a lunatic. And he's <laughs> two little dogs. Somebody called you know, um, the uh, ASPCA. Uh -huh. um, uh, but I would, I would walk for, for miles with and without the dogs, just repeating the words to myself. So I would stay in my little universe cave, learning it, getting it as deeply in, in my heart and mind as I could, and then show up. And you know, the other thing is there wasn't a lot of time to rehearse because as I said, Uzo was doing it with everybody, what I had like eight days to learn. And then we only had two days to shoot the episode. Wow. So all of my coverage would be one day and all of her coverage would be the next. Okay. So that day that came once every 10 days for me was sort of like I was going to have to put on my astronaut suit and go to the moon and hope that I made it through the Earth's atmosphere, you know, not yeah. like what I do to be an astronaut, but it was close. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to imagine it was helpful that one writer, you said Zach, I think Zach penned all of the scripts for, for your character. So it must have been helpful for you to really tap into the, the kind of voice of one writer. Um, I'm wondering what it was like to work with a variety of different directors though, because I believe um, many people were behind the camera for these different different sessions. It was extraordinary. And you know, we're living in a, a, such an extraordinary and wonderful time, time of representation and reckoning. And you know, uh, and this show in its first iteration was 99% white and that it was a great show. Was, I loved the show so much. And it's a wonderfully different universe now. It looks different, it feels different. It's just a different show. And it's reflected in uh, the, the, the director and crew as well. All the directors, one man and there, so that makes there be five other directors for me, yeah. Mm. Uh, and five women and they were all uniquely extraordinary and so well prepared. I mean, weirdly enough, because you only had two days to shoot basically 30 pages, it was even harder for a director because you had to, you, 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 you not only had to know physically what you were doing, you had to so know what was going on emotionally and psychologically with these characters because your camera was gonna move based on that, not based on some piece of action that was written in the script, but by what was going on emotionally and psychologically. So they were, uh, deeply prepared and intelligent and helpful, and um, and you know you 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 need your hand held for that whole for some not the whole day but for some of it because it's like you're climbing Everest or you're on a, like a roller coaster ride all day long and sometimes you're like I'm not getting enough oxygen 
you know, and they mm-hmm. take a break, go eat a granola bar, come back in. And, uh, and so, so yeah, they were, they were a, an extraordinary group of people, um, none of whom I'd worked with before. And it was great to be able to have that relationship. Yeah, you just mentioned a bit about how the past year has changed what happened behind the camera. But what's so extraordinary about the season of In Treatment to me is how topical it is. I mean, it feels like it was written, you know, it's, so con- it's obviously so contemporaneous with, with our moment. What was it like for you after a year that I imagine could have been quite isolating to do these scripts, which are so kind of of the, of the moment, but also um, get to connect with Uzo in character and be so emotionally vulnerable? What was that like after the year that we've had? It was really fun, you know? I mean, I felt so, as did Uzo, you know, we felt so fortunate, so uh, blessed to be able to have a job at all mm. during this time. Felt like such a, uh, um, an extraordinary gift. And then to be able to do this, to dig that deeply and to hold each other. And Uzo was just the most amazing um, leader of us all because she was right there. She was on top of uh, just a mountain of stuff she had to learn. And she makes going to work fun. When you're doing something that difficult Mm. and uh, emotionally um, uh, draining and challenging, I I think the most important thing is you need to make sure you're having fun because in order to go dark, you have to be able to see the light as well. And Uzo, knows how to make a happy set, which is a real great gift. The only other person I know who's like that, I've known a lot of people like that, but Juliana Margulies was very much mm. like that. She made a, she was a great number one. Uzo was a great number one on the call sheet. Um, but to be able to, to play a character who is in some ways a reflection of what the straight white male power structure is going through. I I hesitate saying that because A, I don't want it to seem like these writers were didactic or treacly or Mm. or preachy in this. He's a real, he's a lot of fun, this character. He's a really fun bastard, this guy. (laughs) Um, And uh, and he's also weirdly sympathetic. So as I said in the beginning, it's not a takedown, Um, but to be able to play somebody who we didn't mention, my character's been in prison for four years. So he's a guy who thought he understand the way the world work worked and what the world looked like. And he went away for four years and he comes out and it's not the world he left behind and he feels a little left behind. And guess what? He kind of is. And he has to come to terms with that. I think, you know, part of uh, Colin's uh, journey is he learns by the end of it what he has to unlearn. Um, Like the only thing he learns is that he has a lot to unlearn Mm. about himself and the world he lives in and his place in it. Uh, But but the short answer, it's too late for that, to your question (laughs) is to be in the middle of this in, in, in Los Angeles was really going through it at that time. And HBO and Warner Brothers took such great precautions and had such great protocols in place that we were able to to get through it and we just felt incredibly lucky. Mm, I bet. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Juliana Margulies because for my last question I just wanted to comment that uh, this is the second time on three different series now The Good Wife, The Good Fight, and now In Treatment that you've played this kind of tech magnate genius uh, extraordinaire. What is it about you you think that makes people see you as um, an uber rich tech genius <laughs> let me tell you something it must i mean i i'm gonna say maybe i can halfway act because two things i am most decidedly not one is rich and two <laughs> is oh my god i am the most i mean what you what your readers your watchers don't know is before this we couldn't hear each other and i just assumed that i'd blown up the whole thing and i ruined this whole interview i am the least tech savvy person on the planet, and you're right, I hadn't even thought of that. I play these kind of, these rich, um, brilliant man-child, men-children. Um, I don't know, man. I gotta get more tech savvy and I gotta get richer. <laughs> Gold. Gold. 
John Benjamin Hickey, uh, such a pleasure to have you. Congratulations on the fourth season of Entreatment. Um, and everybody, please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and see more chats with contenders like the wonderful John Benjamin Hickey. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. Thank you.